this is the third series in the third year indeed of the laureateship of podcasts that I have made with some of my fellow writers in which I ask what the hell stroke heaven it is that we do. Not expecting or even needing an answer, but in not getting an answer, maybe some signpost directions towards an answer. I really hope you enjoy them. Today in this series of podcasts called What the Hell Stroke Heaven Are We Doing? as in What is Writing? I'm talking to the amazing Nicole Flattery. Uh, this is her book, Show Them a Good Time, which is a, a book of short stories. Quick and easy to say, but they're very extraordinary stories. What she does, it seems to me, is has her painting finished and then takes the scalpel and just cuts into bits of it to show rather alarmingly underneath the blank that exists under human uh, matters. Um, they're very, very unusual stories. They're very, they are unique to her, which is what you want, of course. She is one of a generation of writers that it are, is impossible to patronize because they are all working amazingly at, at this world-class level. Uh, so I am deeply privileged to talk today to Nicole. The overarching title for these podcasts has been, you know, what the hell heaven are we doing? Yeah. Meaning, what is writing? Mm -hmm. But should we expect, well, it's a question for you, mm -hmm. should we expect writers? To be moral, to be right, to be wrong, mm. is that a prerequisite for being a good writer? Mm -hmm. I think it comes down to intention, you know, like if you, if you, someone like Mark Madonan, I, I started reading, um, I did a lot of theatre, um, mm. embarrassingly. You studied actually. <laughs> yeah, 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 I did, but I did a lot of theatre in my... Was that an acting degree? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's an acting. We can. A lot of people went on. To become it's gone writers. now, isn't it? Okay. Um, no, no. Oh, the oh. actual undergrads, so the more kind of academic courses. Yeah, they, they made it more academic. Um, so I read um, a lot of Martin Martin when I was growing up, and mm. it was influential on me in the sense that I found it really funny, and it was a gateway mm. to to other other things. Mm. Um, so I never found it necessarily offensive. Now I'm a little older, and I go back and, and rewatch it. I saw a play of his here in the town hall um, a few years ago, and people were laughing along in a way that I felt was like, uh. I don't know, performative almost. Like they were laughing at things that weren't like necessarily funny and everything was like extremely heightened and it did make me yeah. think about things differently. But um, That's always been the way with his work. Yeah. Even when it was first produced mm -hmm. 20 years ago. Um, that strange laughter in the theatre. Yeah, yeah, very strange. Yeah. Um, and I had read a lot of his plays. I, I still think of Pillman as a, a brilliant brilliant mm -hmm. play. Um, it's my favorite of his. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, yeah, I, I, I didn't know in the end, what, it, there's a certain amount of cruelty to it, mm. um, but not necessarily intentional. I feel like the other, the other thing when you, you ask about these, these things, like, like I said, the intentions have to be good. You can't just capitalize on a, on a tragedy. You can't be making money off grief that is not your, not your own. You yes, know? but you can quickly characterize yeah. a work as doing that mm -hmm. if by accident when you that book is delivered mm -hmm. it receives a large advance mm -hmm. and sells many copies. Mm -hmm. Most writers are sensible enough when they deliver a manuscript. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you have a, a novel coming <laughs> next year. Have you have you actually delivered the manuscript? No. <laughs> Most people when they deliver their manuscript should say to themselves, in my view, mm -hmm. Okay, this is obviously an atrocious failure, but mm. I'll be able to save the day in a few months and I'll write something else. Mm -hmm. Because how would you know? Mm -hmm. So until that, and every novel, everything you do has a different story attached to it. Mm -hmm. A fate, mm -hmm. an individual fate. So you just don't know if publishers going to be excited by what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So that your, you know, your beautiful book about the plight of uh, somebody in Eastern mm -hmm. Europe, mm -hmm. Suddenly, 
is is much loved, very effective, mm. like Martin, very brilliant, mm. and therefore attracts a lot of money. And then you can accuse that writer, but actually the writer always always goes in mm. as a beggar. Mm -hmm. Do, would you agree? Mm. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, to, to an extent. Um, I think most people go in with good intentions, but then again, there's that kind of recent trend of uh, Ashwood's novels, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, with the the title and. It's hard to it's hard to see when there's a trend of that kind of thing. It's hard mm. to see what the the writer's intentions are are there. You know, like I, I don't think they're necessarily good. Um, but again, it's hard for me to also talk about writing from your own experience. Like the novel I'm I'm writing is mm. not from my own experience at mm. all. Like mm. the only you thing. just suddenly realized. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> but it is. Well, I'm going. <laughs> I have to leave. <laughs> 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 I guess like the only thing you can take things from from your own, from your your own life and mm. apply them, but it's it's a big question. It's a big kind of debate. I, I just don't. I can feel it's only going to intensify. But mm. I don't think it's it's, it's going to lessen. I, I keep thinking we're going to have these conversations again and again, and maybe because the publishing industry is so closed off to to certain certain uh, people that mm. that they just can't get a chance of being published. You mm. know that. They constantly feel shut out, and until they feel included, then mm. they're not going to be able to properly, you know, get their stories. See, it's an enormous thing. Yeah. Um, because even I mean, I've been working for I don't know forty three years, whatever it is now, and even so, every time I begin something, it's yeah. for the first time. The likelihood of getting anything good is so remote. Mm -hmm. It's always the same battle. So in a way, you've got to go where the, the trail of crumbs mm -hmm. leads you. And, and you couldn't even say, you couldn't even say what bread they come from. Mm -hmm. you, they, it's, it's so mysterious. I mean, this is part of this inquiry. Mm -hmm. No, because, I mean, I'm obsessed with the idea that we're only 200,000 year old mm -hmm. as a creature, mm -hmm. years old as a creature. And, before that moment in Africa, for, where for some reason some little leap was made to make us, we have these unknown millions of years of hominins going around the place, some of them painting mm -hmm. and possibly some, some of them talking. Mm -hmm. Our record of things is only, what, 6,000 years old. So even in the time of when we're a creature, there's 194,000 years of stories mm -hmm. of, I don't know if you ever think about these things, <laughs> but it's just sort of thing that obsesses me, that, that there's this great oral silence mm -hmm. for 194,000 years, give or take, and in there is what? Lost. Mm -hmm. And is that whole time contributing to what we do? Mm -hmm those stories, the mouths mm. of those people full of stories. Mm. So, I mean, do you feel in any way, now that I've put it to you, <laughs> a sort of strange sense of responsibility towards their silence, mm. with no technique for writing anything down? Mm. And as we know, the oral tradition can be this immensity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've never thought about it in, mm -hmm. in that particular way. Um, now that I force you to think about it. <laughs> now I'm here under the lights. Um, I, I I don't know. I've I've never um I've thought about the oral tradition. I've I've thought about it in regards to myself, like where this like impulse to to tell stories mm. comes from. Mm -hmm. Um I don't necessarily think I, I, I think about um like plot or the story the story itself. For me it's it's sort of like a language thing. Um you know, I would always start with like a sentence mm. or like a certain word. And mm. I, would, I would think about that uh, and then try and find a story, a way to tell a story that way. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think Irish people tell a lot, like it sounds. Ah, Generalization. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. Um, We're doomed. Yeah. <laughs> um, this will be all over Twitter. The cold flattery. The cold flattery says Irish people. Generalizing our own people. <laughs> Irish people like to tell stories. <laughs> they do though, and I, I feel like I, I've grown up, like my family are like a big storytelling 
um, family. Like mm. I feel like we we worked like mm. as like like every time you a story rather mm. than like mm. conversationally. Um, so yeah, I guess I guess that's, that's where it comes from. But I've never thought about that kind of like well, long silence. Well, Tom Tobin, uh, who kindly did one of these for me mm. with me. Um, I mean, he I I he's something like two months older than me, so he's mm. always uh, I must always uh, defer to him. But, <laughs> Uh, he, he can be quite fierce about this. The yeah. whole idea of storytelling, mm. calling Irish people storytellers, mm. and because he's a complex, uh, you know, and brilliant human being, yeah. he says he was more interested in the Irish silences, mm. mm-hmm. the things not being yeah. said. Obviously, if you were Robin in a head <coughs> singing, mm. you couldn't give a tuppenny damn for what mm. humans do in their spare time, mm. or their full time or their own <laughs> spare time or their occupied time yeah. as in writing yeah. but nevertheless the robin is engaged in something similar it, it, he may be or she may be anxiously repeating the same sentence over and over again mm-hmm. as in all work and no play makes yeah. jack's dull boy in, in that <laughs> film. but nevertheless there's yeah. this propulsion so it, it, could you conceive of it in essence considering you can go to a play in french and sort of understand it yeah. In essence, a sort of the bird, human bird song that attaches to a human creature. Mm-hmm. Would that suit you as an idea? Yeah, no, that does. And um, what you were first saying about uh, silence, or mm. Kong was mm. saying about silence, mm. does interest me an awful lot, and mm. particularly um, women's, like Irish women's silence. Mm-hmm. Um, because I was, I mean, recently I've just been rereading Anna Wright's book of collective book of stories, Yesterday's Weather, mm-hmm. and I was thinking, like I read that book first when I was twenty three or twenty four, mm-hmm. and you know, th- these women were like everything is happening to them, their minds are like kind of racing, like similar enough to, to my stories, but outside there's this like kind of silence, this like total blankness, like you know, this desperate bid to appear ordinary in, mm-hmm. in some sense, even mm-hmm. though that's like that's like it's its own kind of battle. Mm-hmm. And like silence, just kind of it's a useful kind of trick in in that kind of mm-hmm. way. So yeah, I'm interested in what's underneath the silence. And I, I definitely felt like even in the process of writing this book that I, I got to to know myself a bit better. Mm-hmm. Maybe in ways I, I didn't particularly want yeah. to. Um, but yeah, I feel like it's a way of I don't know. I, I feel when I, writing is going well and and I'm doing what I want to do, I, I feel closer to, to people i feel uh, like my uh, own relationships are better i feel uh, like i'm striving for a sort of intimacy you feel um, more human though, yeah yeah as definitely. you've described from that yeah is it is it all right do you think for a read a male reader of the book to mm-hmm. feel an identification with the yes it's totally fine i love that what does that say about gender do you think um, possibly I, I didn't. I I know all those stories are from like a female perspective, mm. and that was actually intentional. I wrote them over a couple of years, so when they they all came together, it's like oh, surprise. Um, but yeah, I think that the feelings I, I don't want to say are universal, but <laughs> like feeling lost mm. or um, feeling out of, like displaced, you know, like displaced by kind of the modern world. It's yeah. like it's not a an exclusively feminine feeling like you know men have also said to me that they they can identify with the book yes because because you're it's really the the quality of your progress through mm-hmm. the brambles and the fog yeah mm-hmm. that defines you i definitely felt like that sense of futility when i was writing that book like who is this for mm. who are you talking to mm. you're just talking to yourself mm-hmm. or five people that might potentially read the book mm. and as you know less and less people read you're kind of you're just facing that and i don't know it, it's kind of hard to to, to get past it and, yeah. and keep going um i think that's where the keep the keeping going that's yeah. the quality of your yeah. progress through the brambles that makes you at least brave yeah can we talk therefore about magic? Mm. Do you sometimes feel, I mean, in your work, mm. here and there, a page or two that was well beyond your capability, mm. that doesn't seem to be really from you, mm. that pages you might have even forgotten until you proved mm. the book, mm-hmm. but there's sort of an element of magical mm. incidents. Magical mm. is just a word for what's not explained. Mm-hmm. How much do you think 
in your own work, in your dealings with your work, mm. in your kind of agency mm. as the assistant mm. to the writer in you, as it were. Mm. What do you do? You acknowledge that? Do you do you cherish that mystery, or mm. does it worry you? No, I, I quite enjoy it. And, uh, mm. Yeah, there's certainly pages in that book that I I'm a big rewriter. So I do, ah. yeah, so I do know that I wrote all of that because <laughs> it was long. Right, right, right. Um, but I do feel that like sometimes when, when things are going well, that, um, yeah, like it, do, it just feel, it doesn't feel like work, which is good mm. because mm. No. I don't like work. <laughs> no, no, it shouldn't be work. Yeah, exactly. And like, it, it, it's, I hesitate to use the word religious, but there, there's something kind of, motivating you from a if it's going well yeah um, it feels like something higher is sort of motivating yes you. would you characterize yourself as a believer in any particular religion it's interesting yeah i've been thinking about this um uh, recently because i've just been reading a, a lot of stuff that's um about religion i was i was raised catholic mm -hmm. like, like quite catholic like mm. go to mass every sunday mm. like then become a teenager and just to, practicing you knew how to do yeah it, serve mass <laughs> All of the no, you didn't serve that. I did. I did. Really? Like it was an altar girl. Oh yeah, well that's yeah. That's, yes, you assisted. I assisted. I, I didn't run the mass. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't put on the attire. No, no, no. They wouldn't let me do that. I tried. <laughs> People have been trying. It. <laughs> but I. Uh, you rang the bell. Yeah, rang the bell, lit the candles, all the, all that business, um, and I, I, I'm afraid that I, I don't like right up until I was, you know. Probably sixteen or seventeen. Mm. Was that in the cathedral in Mongar? No, it was in a small church. In okay, you were practicing Kinigat. there. Yeah, you yeah. Were building up. To yeah, the I never got to the cathedral. There's still time. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Nobel Prize <laughs> of bell ringers. <laughs> um, you're always so proud of yourself if you got the but bell. But it was right. you who burned it down, right? That you can tell me. Yeah, of course, it was definitely me because I wouldn't. But you built it up again. <laughs> but I, 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 I kind of like. And I can't stop sort of thinking about that, the effect of that on my own own writing. Like, I, I think there's yeah. definitely a belief even in these stories of some kind of like sin or like like punishment or something. I, yeah. I was recently reading a book by um, Donald Antrim. It's his, it's his memoir. It's called by? Donald Antrim. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. it's called The Afterlife. Uh -huh. And he's got a he start of one of the sections. It's about his the death of his mother. And he's like walking around every day, you know, there's you're walking around with people and some of you believe in heaven and hell and, and some of you, you mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. and i just thought that was a, a really interesting idea and I, I still don't know if i i fully can discard the idea of like an afterlife you know yes yeah i i came quite late to these things but um i was fascinated by the word eschaton as the threshold between life and death yeah when you're 64 you do start to think about these things yeah. and uh my but my aunt who was a, in her day a very famous singer yeah. Mary O'Hara whom I'm going to see after talking to you because she lives here in Bromley oh, right. but she she was a nun yeah. she was in a, an enclosed order so I a present I got her recently was the Oxford book of is it eschatology I don't mm. know what you call it eschatology whatever mm. this whole area of thinking I mm. suppose but I mean it is dare one say, also deeply intuitive and fictional. Because mm -hmm. these are yeah. things without proof. Yeah. And they're kind of the first stories you really learn in primary school. Like, I went to a uh, Catholic primary school, so and I remember... crucial. Yeah, like, going to see the Stations of the Cross, and then, like, you knew all the stories, like, Moses, yeah. and you, you knew all the big ones, and yeah, <laughs> you used to draw and, them and, and talk the about hymns. them. Yeah, yeah. But so it's kind you of your first encounter. If you were a young Greek, student mm. 4,000 years ago, the mm. first thing you'd hear about would be Homeric stories. Yeah, so yeah. maybe you'd be thinking that. Yeah. Well, do you think any writing can offer kind of solace to? I do think so. And like, I, without sounding too cheesy, mm. um, and I think it's- Don't, don't be afraid. <laughs> I go there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I do think it does. And, you know, it allows you kind of to, to deal with your own mistakes and see yourself and, mm understand yourself like i feel like i you know it's like i said it's tried but when you I, i've like written down difficult experiences whatever i feel like i've understood myself so mm -hmm. much more and i've certainly mm -hmm. 
certainly read books, you know, many mm -hmm. of them by Irish writers too that have helped mm -hmm. me understand myself better. So mm -hmm. I don't think that could be discounted or just dismissed. Mm -hmm. as the idea. solace is in the precision. Yeah. The solace is in the, the actual writing of it. I, I don't mm -hmm. get any solace from being published. I, I found that quite surprising, you know, you don't get any solace or no. joy really from reviews. Or, no. Um, no, I haven't read reviews for 20 years. So. <laughs> good, good choice. <laughs> yeah, it is a good choice. I mean, maybe you do regard yourself as an enormously warrior-like individual. No, but, you <laughs> absolutely know, not. <laughs> mostly writers, in my experience, are just on just the right side of psychiatry most of the time, <laughs> <laughs> but often dipping. I mean, yeah. I, I'm not saying you in particular, I'm talking about myself, that there's a kind of a mer sense of emergency. Mm in the thing that makes up a writer. Yeah. So in, in some way, mm -hmm. you're not only King Knut saying, mm -hmm. drive the waves back, but if you don't drive mm -hmm. the waves back, which you never managed to do, mm -hmm. you're sort of doomed. Mm -hmm. So you actually have to play that trick. Mm -hmm. When you see an instance of somebody writing a tremendous book, mm -hmm. it does give them a putative stature. Mm -hmm. But how can you live? Mm -hmm. you the fact is, it's very awkward living on a pedestal because it, you yeah. probably just get a bit sleepy and fall off. <laughs> yeah, someone will knock you, knock you off. Uh, knock you off, yeah. yeah. Or put a stick of dynamite <laughs> under it for like, um, Yeah. I think that's the, the strange thing about the debut book because you mm. have never experienced that kind of level of criticism or praise or any anything like that, you know? like. I've never had anything. So what stratagems do you have for survival in that uh, in that um, area? <laughs> I wish I Because you more. have been highly praised. Yeah, I wish I had better strategies for survival. I try not mm, to. So do I. <laughs> wish we all so did. Silly. We all did. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> um, I, I try not to, to, to think about it. Like I said, like, mm. and I feel, I feel, you know, lots of people feel this way. Um, you know, you're waiting so long for the, the book to come out or you're all excited about the, the book coming out and then the book comes out and mm. you realize like you realize that you don't actually get a huge amount of joy from like seeing no. the reviews or no. getting praised no. or anything. And it sort of just kind of becomes you become indifferent to it. And what really does you do get pleasure from is actually the the work, you know. Mm. So you say better to what? Ignore it. Do you ever look up what's being said about you? <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, yes. <laughs> but I, I don't know, I guess like it kind of depends on like I, I was thinking, I've read something before and it's like you learn nothing from success, you only learn from failure and I think that's kind of true and I'm not really generally a, too afraid of failure. I think if I was very afraid of failure, I wouldn't have made half of those stories as weird. Well, as, unfortunately as, you haven't achieved failure. Uh, yeah. Like, I, yeah, that's, yeah, but I'm not too, I'm not too worried about it. I, th I think I think huge success is something to be to be more nervous of in, in some re in some regards, you know. Y yes, you, you've made me quiet for a moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I felt pri privileged talking to you. Yeah. We've never met before. Never ever were no. And the only reason I it's, it's strange, isn't it? Because I, I'm not admiring you. Mm coming into this meeting except through reading your work so that's quite mysterious in itself yeah. we could we could have talked about that yeah. um, but um, thank you for thank you I don't know casting your light back on me I think I see some things a little clearer oh. but thank you very much thank you thank you very much yeah. cheers